Hey everybody, I'm really excited about today's episode. I talked with my longtime friend, and I mean long time, all the way back to middle school and high school friend, Anna Brewster, and rather than tell you all about our teenage years, although that might be fun another time, we had a really great conversation about building teams for collective impact and evidence-based health policy. Anna shares her journey from management consulting at Deloitte to cancer prevention at MD Anderson and making the career shift to local government policy. Anna received her master's in public health from Harvard University and is passionate about seeing the impact of local government health policy in action. Our observant listeners may also notice we used a different tech tool to record this episode while we sort out a syncing issue with our regular recording tool. And we know the show must go on. So without any further ado, here's my conversation with Anna Brewster. All right, welcome to the Building Thinkers podcast today. I'm so excited to have my dear friend on, Anna Brewster, and we are going to be talking about all things collective impact, why sometimes we we know things but we don't do them, how we can build effective health policy, and lots of other stuff. So, Anna, thank you so much for agreeing to come on. This is so fun. I'm so glad to be here. I'm really looking forward to our conversation today, Tracy. Thanks so much. Okay, so this will be fun because I like to start with, is there a funny story of how we met? I've I've had recently on a lot of new internet friends, but you were an old dear friend. So tell me from your perspective, our memories a little bit. <laughs> so Tracy and I met in middle school and I started at Tracy's school in the sixth grade. And Tracy and I, I think were inseparable with another good friend of ours actually also named Anna when we were in high school. and. I think Tracy really kept me in line during our teenage years. <laughs> there were many times um, when, yeah, we had a lot of fun driving around, listening to music, I think doing things that that high schoolers do. And um, yeah, just so grateful for friends that you've had for a lifetime and can really pick up where you left off. So I'm really excited to talk today. Yes, and it has been too long since we last officially spoke. And so <laughs> know you have a lifelong friend when you can text the day before and say, hey, my guest for my podcast was going to go further out. I've wanted to have you on and may you please come on tomorrow. So thank you so much for your willingness to join. I, I really have been thinking for a long time about us connecting and talking because anytime we do start talking about the things we do in the work world, um, there's so much alignment and so many things I think that that drove us into the fields that we're in and um, the heart behind it is really similar. And so I'd love to start off with a little bit of your story. Will you take us through how you went, you know, along the way from, um, I wrote down kind of some of the journey from management consulting to cancer prevention to local government policy. Can you take us on that journey a little bit and tell your story? Sure, absolutely. So um, in college, I was initially pre-med and I was always really interested in healthcare and thought that potentially I wanted to be a physician and then had a conversation with one of my professors and really came to the conclusion that I would be able to impact more people if I approached health and thought about that from a policy perspective. And so I switched my major in college to being a government major. And then after college, spent a couple of years in management consulting, working um, for different federal government clients, and then went on to really focus on public health. And so got a master's in public health and then moved back to our hometown, Houston, Texas, and worked for many years at MD Anderson Cancer Center. And so initially did some work around cancer prevention and control. Um, really focusing on the social impact arm of MD Anderson, and then um, worked at a different point of the hospital and focusing on really business strategy and worked for our cancer network that basically uh, works with community hospitals around the U.S. and um, having MD Anderson's uh, quality protocols and really having folks be able to access MD Anderson level care in places outside of Houston. And then the COVID-19 pandemic hit and I really wanted to get back to my public health roots and so decided to take um, on a role in local government here in Harris County and have been focused on health policy in a number of different areas and I'm really excited to kind of took a bit of a shift in my career but it's been uh, really exciting I think to be close even closer to really 
seeing where you have an impact in different places. It's such <laughs> an amazing story. And just thinking about all those different roads of impact and methods of impact and the different things that you've learned there in researching for this. Uh, <laughs> I found a video, I think from yes. 2015 or 2016. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that program? Yes, absolutely. So at MD Anderson, um, we, I was part of an entity called the Cancer Prevention and Control Platform. And so again, we focused really on cancer prevention and social impact work. And we collaboratively were part of um, an initiative called the Build Health Challenge. And together with the Houston Food Bank and Harris County Public Health, we created a collaborative to focus on food insecurity, which really means limited or uncertain access to food. Um, and that is, was quite an issue and became even more of an issue really during the pandemic and folks not having access to food and worked on that initiative specifically in the Pasadena area. So an area southeast of Houston. And that collaboration really only um, the duration of it was just for this um, period of the time we were part of the Build Health Challenge, which was a two-year period. But I think some of the relationships and the infrastructure that we built to support that initiative is, is really ongoing and I think continued with many of the efforts that MD Anderson still does today in that community and beyond. So it was really exciting to be part of that. That was so incredible. Okay, I think that takes us into this idea of, you know, one of the things within Building Thinkers, we ask what you build, and you talked about you build teams for collective impact. And what I want to pull apart is people have maybe heard the term collective impact, but I'd love for you to help us understand more what that really looks like and maybe take a deep dive into there some of the things that you've learned in that. So let's start with what is collective impact? What does it mean that you build teams for collective impact? Or absolutely. So collective impact, I think of it in many ways as a more intentional way of thinking about collaboration. And so collective impact is a commitment of a group of actors from different sectors to a common agenda for solving a specific social problem. And they use a structured form of collaboration. And so not every social problem necessarily needs a collective impact approach, but there are five conditions that are really important to implementing the collective impact approach. So again, having that common agenda. So having these different actors from different sectors rallying around really a common goal. And then secondly, mutually reinforcing activities. And so the different activities that different organizations do need to, to reinforce each other. And then having a shared measurement system. So underlying all of the activities that you have, having that shared measurement, making sure different organizations are looking at similar metrics, similar really measures of success, and then having continuous communication. And so that's important, of course, for organizations to constantly be communicating what are folks doing over here versus over here and just making sure that's all aligned and connected. And then lastly, having backbone support. And so what that means is really an entity that is the convener bringing all these different groups together and providing that overarching support to having this collaborative really able to carry this work forward. Um, so that in a nutshell is what collective impact is. Ooh, I love it. Okay, so let's take one of the steps just for a quick moment. And so the common agenda. So you have these large, you know, social impact space organizations mm -hmm. that are wanting to come together around solving a problem. Where does it start? You know, who does it, is it one actor that, that starts and then the rest come along or is it an initiative that goes out and then people decide to come around that? Like it's kind of a chicken and an egg question, I think. Yeah, I think it really depends on the topic at hand, but I can give a helpful example of from my work at MD Anderson. And so we worked on an initiative called Be Well Communities. And it was a place-based strategy for comprehensive cancer prevention and control, where we worked with communities to promote wellness and stop cancer before it starts. And so in that, in that specific example, MD Anderson was the backbone. And so we really were the convener bringing together different nonprofits in the area, school districts, um, government agencies, healthcare providers, and policymakers to come together to rally around our common agenda, which was cancer prevention. And so the way that that really worked in practice was that we know 
what works in terms of cancer prevention. Like we know really like what some of those best practices are, what our healthy behaviors folks can, can take on, but it's a matter of really rallying folks, different actors around what's gonna work best for a community. And so what we did was we took, um, there's a Robert Wynn Johnson Foundation publishes a resource called What Works for Health. And then they have evidence-based interventions for different types of healthy communities types of work. And so we looked at those evidence-based interventions and thought, what is gonna work well in, in Pasadena, the area that we were working, and took those interventions to the community and so that's community leaders, um, stakeholders from those various groups, and talk to them about what do y'all think is gonna work well here. And so went through that process of figuring out um, really what we thought was gonna work well for this specific Be Well community and got that input from them. And then we fortunately had funding for this initiative. And so once, once we figured out what we wanted to do, we had to figure out who's gonna do it. And so got with our nonprofit partners, the school district, the local government and others, and then figured out how to disperse funding and figured out really what that shared measurement system was going to look like. So we actually had a third party evaluator come in and help us figure all of that out and assess really um, from really the outputs as well as the outcomes of what was going to work well in this community and how to evaluate that going forward. Um, so that's kind of what it looked like. Wow. It's again, just so, so remarkable. And I think about, I spend a lot of time in the education space where we're trying to do similar things in terms of mm -hmm. what works. There's actually a site that's similar, like what works in education and yes. there's specific interventions. And it's like, okay, how do we make sure those things are happening? It's so interesting when there's the tangential, like change management's change management, shifting individuals and collective groups of people. It makes sense that there's similarities, but sometimes it's really interesting to hear it with a different overall space or with a different mm -hmm. overall outcome. One of the sentence stems I really found to be helpful is it, in your field, in the work mm -hmm. that you're doing, if only people knew, what, what is one of the things that if only people knew you think it'd be helpful? I think again, looking at an example from the cancer prevention world is, and I think just building upon a little bit of what we talked about earlier is that we know that estimates from a broad range of scientific evidence show us that more than 50% of cancers can be prevented. But this process of implementing sustainable cancer prevention initiatives requires this really sophisticated cooperative efforts like we were talking about with collective impact. So I think if only people knew how much more effective we could be if we collaborated together in a cohesive and intentional way, we could have so much more of an impact. And so, yeah, that's something that I think about a lot of it. To me, it just seems so logical. And I think for a lot of other people, it's just there's um, the contribution versus attribution because in collective impact, you don't necessarily, the collective gets credit for the work. It's not, you can't attribute an individual, the impact to just an individual group or an individual person. It's, it's really the collective. And I think that's often not the mindset that we're, we're really given of how to think about things. And it's really hard to shift that mindset. Yeah. That's really interesting. Cause I was going to ask, okay, what are some of the things that hold us back in your, yeah. in your experience from getting to that? So one of those things is the way we're wired to be individualistic, even, even in the pursuit of overall mm -hmm. well of others, but having this credit and to your point attribution and maybe some folks not wanting to just be, or not seeing the power of being in the collective and trying at it as individuals. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Anything else around that, that you've seen, why doesn't it work sometimes? <laughs> Yeah, and I think, honestly, I think about in the social sector and in philanthropy, when you're often providing funding or a grant to one specific organization, and so that in and of itself doesn't incentivize groups working together necessarily. It's one, it's different groups competing for the same funding. And so that's why the Build Health Challenge, I think, was so exciting, because as part of your application process, you were required to be collaborating with two different entities. So it was a, a hospital partner, a local government agency, and then a nonprofit. And so in order to receive that funding, you had to be collaborating. And so I think there are ways to work around that, but it's often just, I think the incentive structures aren't necessarily aligned to, to make this work most productive. Right. And then it also just made me think about like just the different strengths that those different organizations and yeah. entities bring to the table. And so a nonprofit 
going to have different than a research organization yeah. is gonna be different than the implementation arm of the work. Right. Have you all seen that, that be a piece of the power is the different strengths of the individuals that are coming together? Absolutely. Cause I think we're all going to approach a problem in a different way and look at it in a little bit of a different way. But, and I think that those different perspectives make you more impactful in the end. And I think that those different perspectives are a positive thing. I end up talking a lot just with people in all different industries about this idea that things get lost in communication, right? And mm -hmm. how we go from this, again, what we know to what we actually do. So even in that work, maybe let's just go more broad for a moment and say in collaboration, when you have all these amazing partners coming together, what do you find is some of the lessons learned maybe about that communication and collaboration you talked yeah. about? There's a really specific process, it sounds like, in Collective Impact to have these five pieces. But what about the more day-to-day? -day? Maybe what does yeah. that and process look like to make progress? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I think one of the key pieces to that is obviously different types of organizations from different sectors. They use different terminology, like different language, different vocabulary. And I think part of that continuous communication or that common agenda is having a common language. And so when we, when I say something to someone, I'm now working in local government, someone to the nonprofit world, what I'm saying may not mean the same thing when they're saying that thing. And so how do we create a common language? And I don't know if I necessarily have the exact answer for that, but at least acknowledging that we talk about things differently and at least trying to create a common vernacular about a specific topic. I think that's really critical to getting folks on the same page and really important to communication as well. Mm, absolutely. I have seen that to be the case as well <laughs> yeah. in different in the education industry and then also in some of the other social impact space work that I've been involved yeah. in is just how much power there are to the words of what we call totally. things. And one of the premises of this podcast too is that there's profound insight in simplicity. So taking the complicated concepts yeah. and overbuilt frameworks and saying, okay, what does yeah. it really mean? And then how can we go forward and apply that? I spend a lot of time when I'm doing learning experience design work, taking research and best practice and trying to get it into activities where participants can take it and apply it to whatever their mm -hmm. content is so they can reap the benefits of the research into the practice. And so maybe that takes us back to in these concepts of, you know, Anna was very um, humble earlier. She got her master's in public health at Harvard. And she probably doesn't <laughs> want to say that just like Erin didn't want to say that she got her MBA <laughs> at Harvard, but I made her. Um, but, you know, what is it when you think back to maybe that learning that you learn, you know, about change management. Let's zoom out for a moment and think about how do we make these policies yeah. change behavior? Anything in that? I know there's a bunch of rabbit trails from there. I love habits. And yeah. I think that there's a lot of examples in habits and health. So wherever you want to go with that, like, how do we make it happen? So my concentration in grad school was around social and behavioral sciences. So thinking about the science of behavior change. And so I'm always very fascinated with that. And I like, I think one of the most important things I learned is information doesn't change behaviors. And so I think policy is really one of the most effective ways that you can change behaviors. And how do you structure policies in a way that really support people to change behaviors? And um, I think one of the most exciting things that really drew me to public health is that a you have to be collaborating in public health because it touches so many things and when public health works it's invisible like you don't think about putting on a seatbelt or that you're no longer allowed to smoke in restaurants or that our water is clean and is able to come into our homes every day but those types of things are so critical to public health and how we think about that every day I love that. It's invisible. And then it was also making me think when you said information doesn't change behavior. Mm -hmm. Yes. I have, I have also seen that one. <laughs> um, because we would all have six pack abs and we would, yeah. all, we would invest the way that Erin tells us to invest yeah. in her, yeah. her personal finance course and budget the way she tells us to all of those things. One of the areas that I think 
is interconnected here to the habits that I've been learning is like, once you have that self-discipline and you understand the way the habit cycle works, then I think it becomes about focus and prioritization yeah. because we all, I'm actually working on a course right now about activating human potential, like starting with the individual. And it, it came to me because I think that it's such an interesting moment in time with all of technology has been advancing so, so fast, but with kind of uh, the quickening with chat GPT and it becoming so accessible to people to realize, okay, I've heard about AI, I heard about AI, but now I am playing with it and I'm yeah. seeing what actually happens. I think it's just becoming even more exponential. And so with that in mind, I keep thinking about this moment in time for people to really learn how to learn. And one of the pieces of that is starting with mm -hmm. your priority, because while we know that you have neuroplasticity and there's really no limits to what you can learn, there is a limit to your time and your resources and yeah. your energy and what you choose to focus on. So I'm wondering in that same way, you know, back to policy, do you find yourself or, or the collective having to make a lot of choices and trade-offs on what we're focusing on and what we're saying no to for the sake of that focus? I think I got to a question there maybe. And I think every day we think about like, what are our priorities and what do we have to focus on with limited resources? And yeah, I, I think an example I can give from some of our work today is that the county has $915 million in American Rescue Plan Act funding, which is COVID relief funding. And so we have obviously this set amount of funding we have in prioritizing where we want to spend that and what that looks like. I mean, it's something that we think about every day. And I think how you think about that prioritization and thinking about some of this in the policy context and in the implementation complex context is that thinking about uh, we want to be piloting projects that are going to work for Harris County and that are going to potentially be sustainable for the future. And so that's those are hard decisions to make. And then you also want to have the flexibility um, like it's it's the the push and pull between we want to be focused on an evidence base of what what really works, but then also want to be able to pilot things and say, well, we've never tried this here, and let's see how that works. And so that's a balance that we think through. And I think that gets to that prioritization too, because then if we end up seeing, oh wow, this was really successful over this amount of time, then we can think about continuing that for the future and ensuring ensuring that it's sustainable. Mm. Yeah, that tension makes me think about, okay, so kind of the tension between R&D and yeah. new concepts and totally. evidence-based practice, and maybe in some cases, a combination of yeah. being a combination of evidence-based practices, but putting them in a new way or things like that, yeah. which we of course see in the education system. We know that so much needs to shift. We, we're looking at that innovation, but we're, we're not, we're also not experimenting, you know, right. in, in classrooms. We want it to be rooted in um, learning science okay. uh, and and yet how will you shift a whole big system like yeah. healthcare, like education, like maybe politics, mm -hmm. that's another <laughs> one in there, if there are not these spaces to try. I think about the Pixar story in Creativity Inc. They did a really good job of explaining how they protect innovation and allow for that space to truly experiment. And, you know, that's of course in the creative industry where there's not yeah. lives at stake, but some of the principles I think um, I've held on to in the education space and thinking about where you can use the wisdom and knowledge of research with the new realities of what's maybe possible that wasn't possible in the past that hasn't been researched yet. Totally. Because if we're always waiting for the research to get there, then we'll, we'll never have any innovation. Yeah, yeah, total. And that's like a constant push pull in my own mind. And I think even of just like how I personally think about problems too. And that anytime I am asked to think about a new policy, I always want to look at like, well, where has this been done before? And like, how did that go? But then also I think my innate pers personality is I want to believe in possibilities. And so, yeah, you want to have that space for innovation and to see what that could look like. But I also want to know if we're going to be investing and directing funding to something like, I want to know it's going to work, but mm -hmm. it's hard. You, you don't always know that. 
I wonder if we could go into, is there anything else around the gap between the knowing and doing, the gap between the research around cancer prevention and the doing? I mean, what do we know at the individual level that people should be doing? That might be helpful for people to think about if, because the statistic you gave, I'm coming back to that for a second. You said approximately 50 million lives worldwide can be saved this decade by implementing known effective preventative strategies. There's a range of scientific evidence that indicate more than 50% of cancers can be prevented. Okay. So with that lens, <laughs> what do you want to tell our listeners as individuals? Are you able to say that, that, that they should be doing? <laughs> This is not, this is not a medical advice podcast yet, <laughs> so on and so forth. However, what should we be doing? Yeah, I mean, I can take this kind of in two ways, but I, I think uh, a lot of what we focused on at MD Anderson was around those behaviors and areas that make up that 50% of cancers that could be prevented. So that's healthy eating and physical activity, tobacco prevention, so not smoking and vaping, and then sun safety. And then also under cancer prevention and screenings. So those types of things that you would want to make sure are getting a mammogram on time and those types of things. Those are, if those activities are done, we know we can prevent a lot of cancers. And so I think those are kind of some helpful ways to think about it. And then I was thinking about this help, like a specific example too with sun safety and that thinking about on the individual level, of course, you know, it's important for us to put sunscreen on and protect us from the sun and potentially getting melanoma later in life. But are there supports around us to help encourage that behavior? And so I've, this is actually something that they do have in some of our Be Well communities now, but we see those dispensers that have hand sanitizer in them, but there are now some on playgrounds and other places that have sunscreen in them. And so that's providing folks with access to sunscreen. It's free. It's in a very easy way to get. It's paid for by the, by the local government there that they can get, get access to sunscreen. And so it just eliminates that barrier. And then another support in that is, are there shade structures at like a playground that you would take your kids to or that you would go to? Are there structures there that are going to protect you from the sun and having those pieces in place? And then, yeah, from a screening and prevention perspective, do you have healthcare access to go see a dermatologist to ensure that if you have anything that would be problematic and could develop into skin cancer or melanoma, that you're able to do that? But I think it goes from the individual level, but then also there's all those structures and supports around that that really make it possible. So we can only do so much, but having the support around us is important. <laughs> Okay, so we were talking about what drove you into public policy, and you're talking a little bit about the impact. Do you want to expand upon that part? Sure, absolutely. So I, I think one of the pieces that really drove me to wanting to work in local government is when you're able to make policies, I feel like in that ability, you're able to influence people's lives really quickly and have an impact really quickly. And so that's been really meaningful to me to be able to think about evidence-based policies and really think about what is going to work best for Harris County, for residents, and how we can make a change in that space. That yeah. made me think of maybe one other question around this, which is, okay, so now imagine you're speaking to the listeners, most of whom are not directly in local government or policy, <laughs> but they are the people that are the citizens. What would you say to citizens for the role that they can play to support the local government and this work instead of maybe griping about it. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I think first and foremost, I would tell people to vote because that really, I would tell people to vote and I would tell people to learn more about local government. And I think we think so much about national politics and really so much of what happens in our day-to-day -day lives is really at a local level. And so I think to be really aware of what's happening in, in local politics and local government and um, understanding what's happening there, I think is, is really important and getting good people in office. I think that's a really important way for folks to, to get involved and school boards. I know we talked a little bit about education earlier, but school boards have so much influence and so much power in a district. And so that is, I mean, I think school boards are generally elected by a very, very small amount of people. And, and that's really a place where where you can have, have an influence and have an impact on, on children's lives. 
Yeah. Wow. Um, if you want to hear more about school boards, you can listen to our, our Building Thinkers podcast episode with AJ Crable, who has an amazing book on school boards, specifically that if we want student outcomes to change, he says student outcomes won't change until adult behaviors change. It's really powerful and true. And um, so you can read um, <laughs> great on their behalf. That's his book. Um, okay, that takes us to book recommendations. Anna, tell <laughs> us about your book recommendations. So the first book recommendation is Winners Take All, The Elite Charade of Changing the World. And so this really spoke to me for a number of reasons, this book, because the, the introduction to the book is actually about a woman who's a couple years younger than Tracy and I, and she went to our high school. And she also <laughs> went to the same college as me and then her early career was actually quite similar to mine as well. She went into management consulting and um, I think was really told by mentors and others in her lives that she needed to go get some business experience before she would really be able to have an impact in the world and what that would look like. And to me, I think really reading that book and, and reflecting on kind of where my career has gone and is that not all not all problems are business problems. And so I think we so often want to take what has worked well in our capitalist American mindset and what works well in the business world and want to apply that to nonprofits or to even to local government in some ways. And some of those things are good. And I think how you think about governance structures or what that looks like, a lot of those are are helpful best practices, but but not everything. And so that book really spoke to me and I think is honestly some of the reason why I ended up in local government because I wanted I wanted to be having an impact from that perspective. My other two book recommendations are To Bless the Space Between Us is a book of blessings by the late Celtic scholar John O'Donohue. And it's just a really beautiful book of these very short little blessings that range from like a blessing that you would read in the morning or at night or before, like when you move into a new home or at the beginning of the year or the end of the year and just talk about these transitions that we make in life and how important they are and just ways to bless those, those types of things. And yeah, it's a, it's a really beautiful book. That one just made me think about the <laughs> quote book that you made me like for yeah. my high school graduation. And it made me this quote book that had beautiful quotes in it and like pictures anyway. Okay. Aww. Yeah, I had totally forgotten about that. And that is, I would definitely put one of these blessings in there. They're, they're so beautiful. And I, I love to share them with, with friends. And yeah, they're wonderful. And then the last one is Killers of the Flower Moon, which is a book about, it's actually a very serious book. In the 1920s, uh, members of a Native American tribe in Oklahoma found out that they were living on huge amounts of oil and they quickly became some of the wealthiest Americans in the United States. And all of a sudden they started being murdered because folks were trying to steal their wealth. And so this really, these murders were investigated by the federal government and this really led to the creation of the FBI. So like the entity that started all of these investigations eventually became the FBI. And so it just shows I mean, honestly, it's a lot of it just that makes you think about America and like people that were here before us and what all that looks like. And yeah, it was fascinating. And it was just the journalistic detail that was in the book was just beautiful, um, but a very sad story. But something that I'm now glad that I know about as part of American history. Okay. Yeah. And any podcast recommendations or any other form of input? Yes. So how I built this, I think, is probably very relevant to this podcast. Um, for folks that, that don't know, it's it's a podcast um, that walks you through the lives of entrepreneurs and how they built their their companies that they have today. And it's funny because I really don't have a lot of interest in being an entrepreneur, but I love hearing people's stories because it's so incredibly inspiring. And the one question that he always asks the the hosts always ask folks on the podcast is like did you get to where you are today and building your company because of like grit and hard work or luck? Like how much of it was hard work versus luck? And it's so interesting to see what people say. And I would say the vast majority of people say absolutely a lot of this was luck. Obviously I worked very hard, but there were pieces that fell into place that I had no control over. Um, and so that's always really exciting to hear. And I also think a lot of people also say like, 
if I knew what I knew today about how hard this would be, I probably wouldn't have done it. <laughs> and just like the process, the how difficult it is to build a company and, and do all of that. But it's so inspiring. So I love listening to that. And then the next two podcasts that I would recommend, I love it or leave it is it's a political podcast, but it's basically like a comedy variety show. And often the news of the day is quite depressing. And so they, they put their spin on it and make it funny. And um, it's, it's just a great podcast. The host is a former President Obama speechwriter, and he's great and just very smart and very funny. And then I love This American Life. Um, I think people's stories are just amazing. And like the types of people that make up like who we are as Americans and how, yeah, just how people go about their lives is just so interesting and fascinating. So I always love what you see that. Love it. Okay. And then you put for learning courses, Aaron Schultz, our good <laughs> friend who's been on the podcast. I don't remember which episode that is, but a couple back has her personal finance course. We'll put the link to that. Um, she has one now around um, saving for having a baby. So yeah. we'll put that one in the episode description too. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Aaron, Aaron is an amazing entrepreneur and I think has worked so hard. And I often like tell her about something that I heard on how I built this and how it could apply to her business. And um, yeah, I'm so proud of what she's built and it's really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Part of the reason why I was frantic to make sure that I recorded an episode was to not break the streak because this episode will be one year of recording and posting two uh, episodes a month. So Thank you so much, Anna, for coming on. So much fun to hear about the amazing work that you're doing and the things that you've learned. And, oh, I wanted to also just ask, um, where can people find you? Or is there anything you'd be interested in connecting about? Yeah, folks can definitely find me on LinkedIn if they ever want to reach out. I am a good resource for how to take a risk and change careers. That's definitely something that I've done within the last year and I don't regret it for a minute. And so I'm, I'm really excited that I did that and made a shift really from pure healthcare and working for a hospital in, into local government. And then I'm interested in evidence-based policy. And so anytime anyone wants to talk about that, always excited to talk about policies and how we can really have an impact in that space. Wonderful, Anna. Thank you again so much. Excited to stay connected and um, talk soon. Thanks so much for listening to the Building Thinkers podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and share with your friends. And if you enjoyed what you heard, please leave a podcast rating and review. That helps more listeners find us in the world of podcasting algorithms. You can find out more about my learning and development strategy services at buildingthinkers.com. And remember, there's no limit to what you can learn.